Hi, this is Gary Habermas. I'm the Distinguished Research Professor of Apologetics and Philosophy at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. I teach full-time in the PhD program here, and I have been a guest on the program by Nick Peters on uh, many occasions, and over the years I've noticed how many excellent guests he gets and I can tell you personally that Nick reads everything that comes his way. He's a great interviewer. He's got good insight and questions, and I highly recommend his program. You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. And welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I'm Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today we're breaking new ground. We've had a friend of a ministry donate a webcam. So this is the first time in a long time, ever since we were on Grok Radio, that we are doing a live podcast. This is definitely the first one we're ever doing with a live video feed. And I'm hoping next month to purchase some video editing software and such so I can start making videos as well. Uh, If there was one topic I'd really like to jump on, looking at it, be uh, responding to the group that my friend David and I call the Rapture Brigade. All these people want to make predictions about when the Rapture will take place. Kind of have some fun making some videos. If you've if you've seen the kind of things David Wood does, you're probably doing that kind of thing. Now, today, we were hoping to have Doug Grotice on talking about his book, Walking Through Twilight. But for some reason, he hasn't got back in touch with me. I, I've tried reaching out, and nothing's happened. So, I don't know if something's wrong with his wife right now, and he has to take care of that. I just don't know. But... I figure today in tier five, we would talk about the problem of evil here. And like I say, I can see what you are saying here. And if a question comes up that's relevant to a topic, I'll try and respond to it. Yeah, but. Okay, the problem of evil. Now, personally, with me, I think the problem of evil is one of the weakest arguments against theism and Christianity. And it's also one of the best arguments against theism and Christianity. Why would I say both? Because if you write it out on paper, logically, there's really not much of a connection. I mean, the logical problem of evil, even many atheist philosophers agree with us, it's been dealt with. It's been defeated and such. But what makes the problem of evil such a difficult topic many times for us to talk about is when it becomes personal and our emotions start overriding the problem for us. That's when we start having a problem with evil going on. So we're going to be trying to look at many different aspects of the problem of evil for this time here. And if you mind, I'm doing this off the cuff, people are didn't get to do much preparation right now. I'm actually reading some about Old Testament theology, so this is how different this is. But the logical problem of evil normally begins that God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is good and loving, and evil exists. And this is supposed to be a contradiction, because the idea is if God is all powerful, he would deal with evil. If God is all knowing, he knows how to deal with evil. If God is good and loving, 
he wants to deal with evil. Yet evil exists. And many times we're told you can believe some of these things, but you can't believe all of them. As you can tell, I don't go that route. I hold all of them. And Alvin Plantinga was a philosopher who really dealt with death for this. By just simply pointing out God has a reason for allowing evil and a plan to deal with it, and it hasn't and it hasn't come to a conclusion yet. And that's really dealt with the problem of evil in many ways, that God has some good reason for allowing a certain evil to take place. And for many of us in our lives, we can look back and we can think to a time of suffering that we've had in our life. And at the time, we would not have chosen that suffering. I don't think at any time many of us would choose a suffering. If we could avoid it, we would always want to take the path of least resistance. But suffering comes to us at these times. And when we're in the midst of a suffering, we think, this is awful. This is the worst possible thing. I, I don't think I could ever bear going through this. I, I don't think I can handle this. That's the way evil looks in the start. But later on, we find that a whole lot of good actually came from that evil. And it wouldn't have happened if that which we call evil hadn't taken place. In that way, I am agreeing there is such a thing as real evil, no relativism here whatsoever. It's not saying all suffering is necessarily something bad to an extent, that we should do everything we can to avoid suffering. Some suffering is really needed for our character and such. It's, it's really a way God gets our attention. And for me, when I was in high school, I started having depression and anxiety and panic attacks and such. And it was the worst suffering I had gone through at that time. <clears throat> and keep in mind, this was even after going through major back surgery. I've got a steel rod right back here on my spine. And yet the emotional psychiatric suffering was worse than that was. <clears throat> so, I was in the midst of this suffering in my own life, in high school. I and mean, then when I graduated from high school, I wasn't sure what I'd be doing with my life at that point. But I knew a lot about the Bible, and it was recommended I go to Bible college. And vocational rehabilitation would be willing to pay for my undergrad, since I'm disabled being on the spectrum and such. And they had suggested when I was applying, said, you know, you should go and be an engineer. No offense to engineers, but engineering is just something I'm not interested in. They said, look, you're so smart, you know all this stuff, and we don't think you should go into ministry because we just don't think you'll be able to handle public speaking. Which... Looking back now, most people are looking and say, that's pretty darn funny there. <clears throat> but yeah, that's what they said. I said, nope. <clears throat> I'm going. I'm going to go to ministry. Now, that pat, at that point, I was thinking I'd be a pastor somewhere. Looking back now, I realize I'd probably be a terrible pastor because I'm not too much of a people person. And I hate administrative stuff. Like that, I'd probably be just sitting in a meeting playing Simon's Cat on my Kindle or something like that instead. Anyway, <clears throat> I get into Bible college, still going through this time of depression and anxiety and such. <clears throat> and while I'm there, there was a student one day who's studying or something, and I ask him what he's studying, and he says, apologetics. And I say, what's that? Yeah, you all can tell how long ago this was, Finn. <clears throat> and he tells me what it is. I found it in the back of my mind. I'd also been talking on the internet to people about Christianity. I realized I needed to be able to say something when atheists and others came in, because I had no clue what to say. So I started. The first book I read was Morvid a Carpenter, which was pretty good. 
But the next book I read was the one that I say lit my fire, and that was the case for Christ. And as I started going through that, I think I read it in about three days, and I was just absorbing everything. And yeah, I can see the door just open behind me here, and chances are, if you could see, it's probably our cat coming in. But anyway, uh, I w went through Case for Christ incredibly quickly, loved it, and it introduced me to several other books I could read. Case for Faith, shortly after that, did the same thing. <laughs> and from then on, my path was set, and you know, all that depression and anxiety that I'd had, it went away. And yeah, if I was in your video, you can see Shiro sitting right back there in the background there. That's our little kitty. Um, it went away. And I never would have been in that time if I hadn't gone through the suffering that I went through in high school. It was a gift to me. And now normally, several years ago, I would have said, see, doing that led me to coming to know about apologetics and that gave such great meaning and purpose to my life so therefore it was good but once again I didn't have a whole story because as many of you know apologetics drove me to Southern Evangelical Seminary and at Southern Evangelical that's where I met Gary Habermas and Gary Habermas was the one who eventually asked me do you know Mike Lacona and I said well he you wrote a book with him, and he did a debate here against Bart Ehrman, so yes, I know about that, and said, well, he has a daughter, and he wanted me to talk to her because she's on the spectrum also, and as you know, that daughter is my wife today, and the wife that I have today and the work that I'm doing today, it would not have happened had it not been for suffering, and that's the thing about the problem of evil, that we are all extremely short-sighted that we don't look and see, geez, what good can come out of this? We often have a strange thought that I can't think of any good that can come out of this. Therefore, there is no good that can come out of this. You know, last I checked, none of us are omniscient. It's kind of like we're critiquing a story right in the middle without seeing where the author is going. And if you're being a good author, no matter what kind of bind the hero will get in, the author will make sure it works out well in the end. So, and when I see the logical problem of evil, then it doesn't click with me. It might click if you start thinking emotionally, but really, it doesn't. And yeah, I'm still a turn this way so that if anyone wants to, they can see Shiro sitting over there and such, being his adorable little self. And Shiro, in many ways, is kind of a reminder for us, too. When we got him, he had been abandoned at an apartment complex we were visiting. And yet, today, he's our little bundle of joy that someone didn't want him. But that doesn't mean he's unwanted. It just means the people who really want him had to come alone. That was us. Just by the way, that's very relevant to abortion. There was really no such thing as an unwanted child. There was just a child not wanted by some people. So if a logical problem of evil isn't that big a deal, what is the big deal? And the big deal is often the emotional problem of evil. And the emotional problem of evil is really so convicting to us because we are very emotional beings for the most part. Unless you're some kind of sociopath who doesn't have emotions, this hits you. When you are in the midst of suffering of any kind, it's very tempting to ask why. I'm going to tell you it's not wrong ask why. If you think it is, go read the Psalms sometime. The psalmist regularly asked why is this happening? And it's quite an interesting thing. 
we usually look at our Christian day and ask, are we being faithful to the covenant promise we made to God? Which we should be asking that. But when you read the Psalms, the psalmists are usually looking to Yahweh and saying, Hey, uh, God, you remember that promise that you made? Are you going to be faithful to your promise? Are you going to be faithful to your covenant? And that's our great hope today when the problem of evil comes up. God is going to be faithful to his covenant. He is going to keep his promise there. And sometimes it might not even be in this lifetime. Sometimes the reason for a suffering that takes place in our lives might not come for years later, several several years down the road. And we can we can remember the biblical promise that whatever suffering does come into our lives, it will be used for good. It be, it will be redeemed. This is a win win. Now, someone out there who's more of a skeptic of Christianity might be saying, Where, geez, you're kinda of taking the Bible for granted here, aren't you? You're kinda of taking God's existence for granted. The reason I'm doing that in this case is because when we're talking about the problem of evil, what it's trying to show is there is an internal problem with Christianity, that you can't believe all these things. And so we have to take Christianity as it is entirely and look at it and see if it stacks up, if Christianity is coherent within itself. Because if it's not coherent within itself, then... It's a false worldview. If it contradicts itself, it's got a problem. But if it can survive all these problems, such then it's a coherent worldview. It doesn't mean it's true. It's a necessary condition for it being true, but it's not sufficient. We still have to argue the case of a resurrection and such. If we're arguing theism, we would still have to say, well, yeah, this isn't a problem for theism. But theism still needs to be established on its own elsewhere. So I want to make sure everyone really understands that part. So what do we do and about the emotional problem of evil? What happens when we do get the times where there are unruly emotions and we don't know what to do with them? And I want to say in all this that I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't discount you all going to those people. They're great and wonderful people, and we all need someone like that. I'd encourage anyone listening, you're, even if it's not a counselor or a therapist, find someone in your life, someone of the same sex, by the way, who can be a mentor. And it's good to have someone of the same sex because usually they'll be closer to the way you think and act and everything else. But understand things about me. It's not to say don't go to other people. Still, there are some women I go to sometimes when there's something that's bothering me that I need to talk about. And of course, the number one person I usually go to is my own wife. But I think you need someone consistently that you can count on and you can rely on to be there when suffering strikes, someone who can guide you and lead you. I have someone like this, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that because I'm still learning. All of us are. So what do you do then when the emotional problem of evil strikes? And keep in mind, I, I, I am watching a feed, so if someone has some question relevant to a topic, just let me know. Well, even before you met, I'd say if an atheist raises this topic up, what I'd tell an atheist in time is the burden of proof lies with them. If they want to say the problem of evil disproves theism and or Christianity, they have to place that burden. They have to look at any particular evil and be able to demonstrate that no possible good whatsoever can come of this. But what I could say in any case is, they could say, well, do you know what good can come of this? No, I don't. But you know what? 
all you've done with that is you've demonstrated that I'm not omniscient. And I would have gladly conceded that to you at the beginning. I would have gladly told you, no, I don't know everything. But you have to establish your own kind of omniscience. You have to show me there is no good that can come from this. Now, you could be right, of course, but it has to be demonstrated. If it's not demonstrated, then it's not a logical, clear-cut, 100% proof. And keep in mind also, all of the, these arguments from Ewart we get, they are just that inductive arguments of sorts. They can't prove with certainty. Many of the arguments I use for theism, such as the Thomistic arguments of Aquinas, they do prove with certainty that theism of some kind is true. And if you read the Summa Theologica, it's a pretty sophisticated theism that's actually true. So the inductive doesn't overwork the deductive. Now, before we start talking about the emotional problem of Eva, I like my when you're listening to the Deeper Wars podcast, we're doing our first live feed here. I see several people in here watching. Good to see you all. And again, if you have questions, type them in. I'm liking everything being said. And today it's just me. I guess couldn't make it for whatever reason. But if you're here next week, <clears throat> I'm having my ministry partner, J.P. Hoeing, come on. Again, you all heard me probably talk about Bart Ehrman's latest book, The Triumph of Christianity, which is really a pretty bad book. I hate to say I was very disappointed by this one. And my ministry partner has been disappointed by it too. And one of his best arguments for the truth of the resurrection <clears throat> is, in fact, the triumph of Christianity, that it survived when she died. And we're going to be looking at Ehrman's book together and then looking at my ministry partner's response and his argument that I think is more powerful to show that, yes, Jesus did rise from the dead. So J.P. Holding is going to be back with us next week to talk about Bart Ehrman and the triumph of Christianity and why his honor-shame argument for the impossible faith does make a very powerful case that Jesus rose from the dead. <clears throat> so, now, getting back to the emotional problem of evil, and this is something I largely get from Gary Habermas here, and that's that evil in our lives is often... It's bad enough when evil happens to us, and yes, I'm still trying this way so anyone can see our little kitty where they want to. It's bad enough when evil happens to us, but what makes it worse is sometimes we tend to prolong it. And we often prolong it by the things we tell ourselves about the evil. And consider the case of a child who grows up with abusive parents. Okay? This child is abused regularly and told horrible things about themselves. They're told they're no good, they're useless, they'll never amount to anything, X, Y, Z, whatever it is. They're ugly, they're stupid. This child is told all this stuff. Now, all this is evil when a child is told this regularly. What makes it worse, though, is when the child joins in and starts telling it to themselves. They say, all these people are saying this here. I guess I really am this way. That's when it becomes a problem, because in that case, the child has downloaded it. And that message is, in essence, put on their hard drive. And they internalize it. They consider it part of their identity from that point on, unless it's dealt with. You might. We can look and say, this is a small child. They're not capable of understanding. Like this. They're not capable of reasoning. They don't know how to refute what their parents are saying and such. I agree with all of that. I get all of that, okay? But it doesn't still change the reality is all this suffering is going on still. Okay, when I had some stopped at the apartment or office, pick up a webcam in. 
I have some green tea there, which is proof that God exists. When they stopped having tea, that was part of the problem of either. But the child is has internalized the message, and now they don't need the parents there telling them all this abusive stuff. They're telling it to themselves. They are becoming their own abusers. And this is something that Gary Habermas has taught me, and he gets it from, I believe it was Albert Ellis, the great actually atheistic psychologist, therapist, whatever term works, who came up with this idea that what really causes the most suffering in our lives is not what happens to us. It's what we tell ourselves about what happens to us. And what we tell ourselves about suffering is usually very bad and usually very wrong, too. And the worst part about it is there is often some grain of truth to that, but it gets exaggerated and blown out of proportion to become something monumentally huge that was never meant to be. There was a time, I remember I was on part of a forum online, a theology web forum, and in the staff area there was a talk about two members of a staff that had kind of a rift come between them. And one of the ladies involved said, oh, I, I don't know if things will ever work out. I'm, I'm just so scared that things will never, never pan out, that this will always be a problem. I remembered when she said this. And a year later, to the date, I went to her and messaged her and said, Hey, how's your relationship going with so-and-so, that same person? It's going fine. Why do you ask? I said, because a year ago today you said that you thought it would never work out and things would never be the same between the two of you. And I think that's when it hit home. I said, yep. I did say that, and it was wrong. There's a lot of truth to what Jesus says about, you know, don't borrow suffering from tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Deal with what's going on today. There was a saying from Mark Twain where he said, I have worried about many things in my life. Some of them have actually happened. And this is the time that we do need to go to those wise counselors in our lives <clears throat> and ask them what they think about what's going on. Because if we are often very emotionally involved in whatever the situation is, we're not able to give a good, rational, objective look at what's going on. We will make it far worse than it really is. Someone on the outside can see it far more coherently and say, well, this is what's really going on. And we need to be able to listen to them at that time. It might not be that easy. It might not deal with the emotions at the time. It very rarely will. But it's what we have to do. We have to step back and look at it. Another thing you have to learn to do is when these strong negative emotions come up, don't listen to them. It's very hard to do that, but don't listen to them. I've told this analogy because my wife and I are part of Celebrate Recovery, and I've told this analogy to a group on our Facebook page and such. That years ago when I lived with my parents, we lived on a dead end road. I used to go walking. I had a walking stick with me, and I had my book with me, <laughs> and yes, I can walk and read at the same time, and there was a dog on that road that would sometimes come after me, barking, but he was a car, he looked just like Lassie looked in the TV show, and this dog never bit me, but it growled a bit, and it barked quite a bit. And I got scared. I'd have my walking stick ready. If I need to attack, I have to attack. I don't want to, but if I need to, I do. I'd walk backwards, scared Siri. And 
I'd be terrified to come by there every time. And then one day I remember dogs sense fear and they respond to fear. In reality, this dog has never bit me. It's just looked very intimidating. So what I started doing at that point then was I would come to that spot and I'd be walking and I'd read my book and the dog would then come after me and I'd keep right on going. I paid no attention whatsoever. And this dog would just keep barking and for one would have known it was getting ready to bite or anything. But I didn't respond. I kept going. And I never got bit. It was never an issue after that. The dog was still there, yes. But I chose to not listen. So much so that after a while, it didn't even matter. And so what I tell people then is when these strong negative emotions show up, by all means, acknowledge them. Know that they're there. But then go on and live your life. Because there's no virtue in just saying, I'll do the right thing when I feel like doing the right thing. The good thing to do is to do the right thing even if you don't feel like doing it. Even if you feel the exact opposite. Uh, Some example I've used is there can be many times I've been doing something all day. I haven't got to have that moment of peace to myself. And I can sit down on the couch and have my book out, get the remote, because I do both at the same time, turn on a show, sit there reading, watching. Finally, I'm at peace here. And then my wife's cooking something, and she needs me to go to a store and pick something up suddenly. Keep in mind, she can't drive, so I have to do it. I certainly do not feel like doing that for time. Personally, I don't want to be doing that for time, but you know what? It's the right thing to do. So what do I do? I get up and I do it anyway, because that's the right thing to do. Many of you listening who could be parents, <clears throat> you understand this. If it's for wee hours of the morning and you hear a baby crying, very few of you really want to get out of bed and go change a smelly diaper or whatever it is that a kid needs taken care of. But you do it anyway because you have to do it. And it's just the right thing to do. So I'd say one of the first things to do then <clears throat> is to learn to not listen to your emotions. Now, if you need a counselor or a therapist to help you do this kind of thing, that's fine. And I'm not saying it's entirely easy. My wife can tell you still, babe, if we get in a swimming pool together, my emotions go absolutely haywire because I'm extremely hydrophobic. And we haven't yet figured out the key to, to overpowering it, but it's a process. And it is something that, that is being worked on. And we all have issues of sanctification that we're working on until the time of the return of Christ. We all be working still. But that's okay. It's okay for us to not be perfect. One of the things I also tell my princess is God gives us a great freedom to be gloriously imperfect. That he's still working on us. It's okay if we're not perfect. That's what he's going to make us into someday, but he knows we're not there yet. And he has grace for us. And if he has grace for us, we ought to have it for ourselves. Because if we don't, in many ways, that's pride. We're saying we are better than God. We know better than God. We know what's right to do better than he does. And that's not a good position to be in. And something I I tell people when they call like this, okay, if you are experiencing this negative emotion right now, what would you be doing? Well, I'd like to go do X, Y, Z. Okay, go do that. But 
I don't feel like doing it. So what? Go do it anyway. If it's the right thing to do, just do it. Maybe your emotions will catch up later. If they do, great. If not, well, you know what? You've still done the right thing. And this gets to something else Gary Habermas talks about with dealing with the problem of evil and doubt and such. And okay, our kitty ran off just now, so I'm guessing my wife just got something to eat and he's decided that's more important than pleasing you all with his wonderful presence. <clears throat> but something else that Gary has said about how to deal with this is if the bad things you tell yourself can knock you out so much. What about the good things you tell yourself? Can they do the exact opposite? And yes, they can. When Gary gives a story, he gives the example of Monday Night Football, for instance, that a guy can get immediately excited many times. <clears throat> well, not all guys. I could care less about Monday Night Football. When Super Bowl time comes around here, there was one person in this household who is usually watching the game and is very excited about it. And the other person just wants to pay attention to the commercials. I'm not for one excited about the game. How he likes the game, I don't care about it. I've never really understood football. I read my book and I watch the commercials. But whatever it is, <clears throat> you can think of some good thing and be looking forward to it. This, <clears throat> this month, for instance, I did take her to a concert once to see one of her favorite bands. And any time she was having a hard time, she could have said, You know what? I'm going to be going to this concert on this day. And that would have been a positive uplift. And I noticed something. Whenever you tell yourself something positive like this, and we all have done this before, you tell yourself something positive and you feel better about things, Usually, whatever was stressing you out before, that situation hasn't changed a bit. The same problem could still be right there. What has changed, however, is that you're telling yourself something good and hopefully something true as well. No matter how trivial you might think it is, if it can give you a boost, then that could be just what you need. Now, when it comes to the problem of evil, then, what are some good truths you can tell yourself? Well, that's a reason our churches need to have good theology being taught regularly. <laughs> because without that, well, guess what your theology is usually going to be based on? It's going to be based on either your emotions or your experiences. Neither one of those are really good ways to find out who God is. You don't know who God is just from your emotions. You don't know who he is just from your experiences. <laughs> if you did that with any other relationship in your life, it would be chaos. You know who the person is by interacting with them and their thoughts and such. For Christians, <laughs> this means prayer and study of scripture and anything else that can give us knowledge about God. I think good philosophy can tell us some things about God. Scripture definitely can. <laughs> now this can be borne out in our experiences. But the experiences are not authoritative. You should not use your experience to interpret scripture. You should use scripture to interpret your experience. It's not proper to go and say, well, scripture says that God is good and he's working everything out for my good, but my experience is pretty negative right now, so I can't really believe that. If you give your experience the primary place, you're going to end up in a bad way. If you give your experience the secondary place, you're going to be looking at it through a different perspective. <laughs> when I was in Bible college, I had a good friend I made who told me about Southern Evangelical Seminary. And he found out also that I'm on the spectrum of autism. 
but he's he's always been a good friend of mine. And then years later, he has a son, and lo and behold, what do they find out about him one day? He has Asperger's. And he messages me and says, Nick, what do you think I should do? And I told him, you know what? Thank God. Fall on your knees and thank him. You have a blessing, really. You are going to see life through a whole new set of eyes that you never would have got to see any other way. And he said that was the best advice he'd been given. Because so many other people, when they talked to him about it, it was like he told them the kid had cancer or some terminal disease like that. (laughs) Apparently, I was the one who said this can be a blessing if you let it be. And none none of what we said changed the reality itself of the situation. His son has Asperger's either way. What changed was his perspective on the problem. He started looking at it in a different way. And right now he does a lot more autism research and helping out so that people can better understand the condition. Again, the situation never changed. It was his outlook that changed. Find podcasts, videos, articles, and more at deeperwatersapologetics.com. And at this point in the show, I'd like to remind everyone how they can donate to Deeper Waters. Uh, I see a lot of you here in the live section here and such. Good to see you here again. And if you have a question, just put it in and I'll see what I can do. If it's relevant to the topic. But if you want to know how to donate, go to my website, deeperwatersapologetics.com. And there's a link there, help support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. And in there, you'll find the link to Risen Jesus. You've gone to the right place. You make your donation there. And that donation is tax deductible because Risen Jesus is a ministry of my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. And then you get in touch with me or my wife, Allie, or Mike, or Debbie, and say, hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. They will make sure that we get your donation, and it will be tax deductible. And we have other ways you can support us, Finn. You can go on Amazon, buy some ebooks. one that I've written, A Creed for the Ages, the Apostles' Creed in Today's Christian. Some I've co-written. God and Natural Disasters, Groundness, Christian Answers to This Generation's Questions, and one of my favorites, Defining Inerrancy. And I I had someone ask this question earlier about where can I go to get my lady jewelry? We have that here. You can go to Premier Jewelers from that site. My friend Lena Clester handles that. And... You can get in touch with me if you need some more clarification on how to do it, but whatever you purchase, 25% of that will go to deeper waters. And guys, Mother's Day is coming up in just a few weeks. Your mother would probably like some jewelry. It'd mean a lot to her. You know, and that, guys, you know what I've always told you about buying jewelry for your girlfriend or your wife especially? That uh, you can buy something special for that lady in your life to make up for that big screw up that you recently did with her. Or you can buy something special for that lady in your life to make up that big screw up that I know you're going to make with her. Now, also, I'd encourage you to please go on iTunes and leave a positive review of the Deeper Waters podcast. <laughs> Yeah, I really love to see those things, guys. It fills me with joy every time I go and look and I see there's a new review waiting to be read. And right now, the podcast, most most reviews have been five-star reviews, which is excellent. There's been a few that are four-star. I mean, it, it's great. I'd like to see more people know about the show. And I, I really just encourage you to do that. <laughs> So now, getting back to the Beaver, what I've said you need to have been is good theology. For me, it was a lot of apologetics that brought me out of personal suffering in my life. Because, you know, Christianity wasn't just something 
it wasn't just some abstract idea I was pay, paying lip service to. It was, I was making it my own faith to apologetics. I was seeing things that showed it was true that I couldn't deny. But I could tell myself when things got very difficult. <laughs> I had a foundation beyond my experiences. And, and by the way, this is another reason I really wish the church would be very careful about the kinds of things that we do and say here. But uh, I really don't like it when we talk about how we should you know, give as we feel led and things like that. Because the Bible never gives divine authority to our feelings <laughs> at all. I mean, there were many times when I've been in a church service there, passing around the offering plate and say, give as you feel that. And I was very tempted to loudly announce that I was putting in a penny and say, well, that's what I felt led to do. I'm quite convinced no one would have accepted that. But why shouldn't they? If I said that's how I feel, well, that, that determines it. And so that's one reason I don't go, is I also don't go out of a personal relationship with Jesus. And yes, I see my princess in the, in the chat here now. I love you too, hon. I also don't go out of a personal relationship either because the relationship you have with Jesus, it's unlike any other relationship out there. Yes, we can say what a friend we have in Jesus. Yes, he loves us, but that love doesn't mean sentiment for us, per se. But Jesus is also our king. He is the one we bow down and have allegiance to. And I think too often we, may, we kind of give this idea of a buddy Jesus. And we lower Jesus to just any other kind of relationship. And this is especially, especially difficult for men. I think, because we don't talk that way about personal relationships. And when men talk, usually men talk and share information with one another. We don't usually sit down and talk about our feelings with one another together. A lot of women do that. Men usually don't. My, when it comes to men, my closest friend in the world who is a man, my closest friend amongst men, I should say, my wife's my closest friend. But amongst men, my closest friend I have there, we pretty much talk about politics, apologetics, and Final Fantasy. That's it. We don't talk about what's going on in our lives that often. <clears throat> That's just the way we communicate. So, what I've said is, apologetics is what brought me out of my, my darkness. Because I was seeing how true Christianity is. You know, it's very hard to get wrapped up in the awesomeness of God when you're wrapped up in yourself. It's very hard to get caught up in what God's doing in your life when you're caught up in what you're doing in your life or what's going on in your life. <clears throat> if you're focusing on yourself, it's going to be very hard to focus on Him. What we have to do then, if evil is learn to forgive ourselves, that it's okay to not be okay to not have it all together. And here, and I think often in the West, when we have suffering going on in our lives, we look and think, oh my gosh, what's going on? Why is this happening? <laughs> Yet all over the world, we have Christians now that are being persecuted by Muslim countries and communist countries and such. And I'm willing to bet they probably have far more joy than we do <laughs> and far more commitment to Christ. Honestly, we should be ashamed and embarrassed about this. And it should tell us <laughs> suffering is not unusual in our lives. In fact, it's exactly what Jesus promised us. There would be suffering. But he also promised us he'd be with us. And we always have to remember that. If God be for us, who can be against us? Go ahead, answer the question. Who can be? <laughs> do we really want to look and say, God, he just didn't know that this time would be coming. He didn't know that this, this, this suffering, 
it's an accident, it's a mistake. God just didn't know what was coming. He couldn't stop it. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think even the staunchest open theist would want to go entirely that route. But those of us who, re who reject open theism, we can't say that. So we have to look and say, God, you've allowed this time of suffering to come into my life. I don't know why you've allowed it to come into my life, but I'm going to trust you in it. <laughs> that if you say this will work out for my good, I'm going to trust you. And I know my friend Clay Jones, who's been on it before talking about evil, would want me to definitely say something about heaven here. <laughs> that heaven is the great promise of Christianity through bodily resurrection as well. That God will redeem everything. <clears throat> that our bodies <clears throat> will be redeemed. When Jesus rises from the dead, it's not just a cool trick to show that Christianity is true. It's a message. <clears throat> See, when Jesus goes and he heals someone, he's not just saying, I've healed them. See, I'm the Messiah after all. <clears throat> what he's really saying is, this person that I'm hearing, this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. <clears throat> When the kingdom of God comes, this healing is going to take place. This suffering is going to end. This is a foretaste of what's coming. If you've been married, you can think about it that way. That this is kind of like the dating phase of your relationship with God. And all of creation can be seen as God flirting with you and giving you little hints <laughs> and saying this is what eternity is like and i remember years ago when the super nintendo came out <laughs> that there was an advertisement for it and it said it had thirty two thousand curves on it <laughs> god could have created a world without colors it probably would have been very easy to do. He could have had a black and white world. God did not create a black and white world. <laughs> he created a world with color. All 32,000 of those colors were originally in the mind of God. <laughs> All of us have to eat to live. God could have made it, but it was just purely nutritional value. Food did not have to have a good taste to it many times. God made it that way, though. He didn't have to, but he did. <laughs> the human race has to reproduce to survive. God didn't have to make it so that it would be enjoyable. But he did. God is not opposed to our pleasure. <laughs> He's opposed to wrong pleasures. He's opposed to turning those pleasures into idols. But he's created a lot of pleasure for us. <laughs> and all these goods... Or a way of God flirting with us. Flirting with us and saying, here's a foretaste of what is coming. Here's a little bit. Until the marriage ceremony, until the consummation takes place, <laughs> where I can fully express my love to you. <laughs> if you're married, you know what this is like. When you're dating your wife or your husband, whichever one it is, <laughs> You can do a lot of things together. You can go out on dates. You can kiss. You can hug. But you know there are things you're not supposed to do. And they have to wait until you get married. And then you can say, now, without limits, I can give you a full expression of my love. But right now, we're in the dating phase of God, as it were. He's flirting with us. <laughs> and... He's, he's a good partner because he's already promised us that he's not going to leave us or forsake us. And whatever evil he allows into our lives, it will be redeemed. And it won't be just redeemed for someone else's good. It's going to work for our good as well. God is going to use it. So whatever suffering you have going on in your life right now, if the Bible is true, God will use it for good. It's no might. He will. You have a guarantee. 
In other words, you're kind of in a win-win situation. If nothing evil happens in your life, great. Enjoy that. <laughs> but if something evil happens in your life, it's hard for the time being. It's okay to acknowledge that. But God will redeem it. He just asks that you trust in him. <laughs> and you really have to ask. Has he ever led you wrong before? It doesn't mean he's always handled the situation the way you would like. In the old joke, everyone wants to serve God, <clears throat> but many people only want to do it as advisors. God doesn't need an advisor right now. Now, there's nothing wrong with you praying and saying what you would like to have happen. And that's exactly what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed and said, Father, let this cup pass through me. But if not, your will be done. In other words, I would love to avoid the cross if it was possible or anything to avoid this unless it means your will is not done. <clears throat> not what I want, what you will. So what I'm advising then when it comes to the problem of evil is do you learn that good theology? Do you learn that Christianity is true? Why it's true? What difference it makes? <laughs> who God is? Who Jesus is? And then go and do the right thing. <laughs> whatever that may be. <laughs> you may not feel like doing the right thing. Oh well. What good is it if you say, I'm going to do the right thing when I feel like it? That's not a Christian position to take. A Christian thing to do is just do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. So do what you should be doing and <laughs> learn how to just let your emotions be there. Enjoy the good ones when they come. But even when those good emotions come, you can't make a steady diet out of them. Because no emotion truly lasts forever. Again, the married couples know this. <laughs> when you fall in love at first, as C.S. Lewis says, that's the explosion that gets things going. But you can't keep expecting that high to last. It's not going to. It couldn't. But instead, what you do is you fall into a rhythm where you learn to trust each other and relate to each other, even when the emotions are present. And it really gives you a deeper intimacy from what you would have had if it just depended on your emotions the whole time. <laughs> if anyone wants some great resources on Eva, Clay Jones's book, Why Does God Allow Eva? I think that's the title of it. A great book to read. I recommend also the writings of Peter Kraft, a Catholic philosopher. Um, one of his best books is Heaven, the Heart's Deepest Longing. I recommend that. <laughs> Just remember that everything will truly work out in the end. There is a good author in charge of the story. Now, please remember everyone, go to my website. Really consider making a donation. I'd appreciate it. I really do hope everyone's enjoyed the first live episode we've ever had with a webcam as well of Deeper Waters. We hope to be doing this more often if our guests are there and if they have the same capacity and such. If, if they've got Skype, then great. You can get to see them too. If not, well, I'm sorry, but you'll have to just see me. I, I know my wife watching won't have a problem with that, but everyone else, you'll have to deal with that suffering. And yes, that proves some suffering as voluntary, in fact. And remember, next week on the show, we're going to have J.P. Holding in here, talking about his, uh, talking about Barterman's book, The Triumph of Christianity. And we're going to be looking at that and then giving a response with the impossible faith. Why is it that the survivor and rise of Christianity can actually be an argument to show that Jesus really did rise from the dead? And what does Bodermann really not understand about the trauma of Christianity? That's going to be next week. For now, I am Nick Peters, and I am signing off. It all
all started with a small time dream. Hold a conference in a church. With a small budget, could we afford to bring in a Christian celebrity speaker? And with an ear to hear more than just the same canned messages, do we want to? With these two questions, The Mentionables were born. We found the best under the radar Christian apologists that we could find writers, podcasters, and bloggers. Their voice was small, but their message was huge. On May 18th and 19th, The Mentionables will be appearing in Greensboro. Head out to Greensboro Christian Church and hear this grassroots phenomena in action, featuring talks and a great debate. Head over to thementionables.org to get your tickets, or call Greensboro Christian Church at 336-621-5226. The Mentionables. Small-time voices, big-time noise.